geez, the Mormons are like the original Zionists? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I guess you could say that. In other words, they... Zion in Mormonism, Zion can mean, for example, Zion for them is Jackson County, Missouri. I'd do anything to catch the guy who did it, Mrs. Hayes, but when the DNA don't match no one who's ever been arrested, and when the DNA don't match any other crime nationwide, and when there wasn't a single eyewitness from the time she left your house to the time we found her, well, right now there ain't too much more we can do could pull blood from every man and boy in this town over the age of eight. They already have laws uh, in place, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, concerning shouting fire to the theater. Right. But there are many others. When we meet in a room like this to conspire to commit a crime, we haven't done anything yet. We're just talking. Uh, it, it, the, the slightest uh, crossing that line uh, uh, is uh, a crime. So the question is like this. When people meet in a public library in San Francisco, to conspire, to exchange tips, how all men are going to seduce boys eight years or younger. Eight years or younger. Eight years or younger. It is solemn mockery before God that ye should baptize little children. Behold, I say unto you that this thing shall ye teach repentance and baptism unto those who are accountable and capable of committing sin. And little children need no repentance, neither baptism. Behold, baptism is under repentance unto the remission of sins. But little children are alive in Christ, even from the foundation of the world. Moroni chapter 8, verses 9 through 12. In our own time, the Lord revealed to Joseph Smith that children should be baptized at the age of eight. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 68, verses 25 and 27. Each year, thousands of righteous children reach the age of accountability and are baptized into the Lord's church. Seven-year-old Michaela Hart of Flower Mound, Texas, is looking forward to her baptism. She reads the scriptures every night and plans to finish the Book of Mormon before being baptized. There's civil rights laws prevents that, Mrs. Hayes. And what if he was just passing through town? Pull blood from every man in the country, then. And what if he was just passing through the country? If it was me, I'd start up a database. Every male baby that's born, stick him on it. And as soon as he'd done something wrong, cross-reference it, make 100% certain it was a correct match, then kill him. Yeah, well, there's definitely civil rights laws prevents that. Zion, for them, is Jackson County, Missouri. Mitt Romney has announced he's running for the Senate for the wonderful, from the wonderful state of Utah. He'll make a great senator and worthy successor to Orrin Hatch and has my full support and endorsement, which is interesting because, as you may recall, almost exactly two years ago, Mitt Romney did something that rarely is done in modern American politics. He broke with his party and went full force after Donald Trump, who was a candidate at the time. He tweeted, if Trump had said four years ago the things he says today about the KKK, Muslims, Mexicans, disabled, I would not have accepted his endorsement. Trump endorsed Romney over Obama for president in 2012. But now that Trump has endorsed Romney for senator, Romney said, anyone want to guess? Thank you, Mr. President, for the support. I hope that over the course of the campaign, I also earn the support and endorsement of the people of Utah. Boy, when Mitt gets to the Senate, he's going to fit right in. Uh, just too weird. Bishop Romney and the Mormon takeover of America. Polygamy, theocracy, and subversion. And now that Romney is getting within, quote-unquote, striking distance in the polls and being put ahead in the rigged polls, it looks like they, maybe they're going to try and put him in there to crack down on the middle class, uh, to maybe start more wars. It, it kind of looks like a Bush-Cheney thing all over again. And here to tell us about the bizarre background of the Romney family and of uh, this strange character who's riding out of uh, the, the Mormon subculture uh, <laughs> straight towards the White House. They refer to themselves as the chosen ones. Now, the Mormon church are also an appendage of the chosen ones. I come. That's what led me out of the church. You say, I, I said, wait a minute, chosen ones of who? Mm. You see, uh, and that's, this is all a smoke and mirrors hoax, and it's a grand design, Heinrich, and this sounds really far-fetched because of the programming involved in, in people's minds, but this is a group, a cobble, that have no less of a grand desire than to control and rule the world. Mm. And I, I, I'm sorry, to, 
to see that happening, you have to sacrifice something on their altar. And that something is freedom of expression, freedom of individualism, freedom of the human uh, being to find him or herself, period, regardless of your race, your creed, your nationality. Something has to be sacrificed, and that is what is to be sacrificed. Individualism, freedom. I had to make a choice, you see. What I uncovered is simply the truth to me, to my soul, to my heart, which is all that matters to me personally, right? Yeah. I had to, I, I found and uncovered that really Mormonism from its very inception is an appendage of what is best called Zionism. Zionism is a political movement. It's not a religion. It's a political movement by certain Ashkenazim Jews who are masquerading as God's chosen people. Now, you say. I know what you're, what you're referring to when you say that, but explain that for some of our listeners that might not be familiar with what Ashkenazim is. Well, Ashkenazim is a, is a term. It's, it's 85% of modern Judah. Judaism is composed of these Ashkenazim as opposed to the Sephardim. Sephardim are basically the, the Semites, the true Semites of Middle Eastern descent. The Ashkenazim are European Khazar tribe members that converted en masse to the religion of Judaism, not the bloodline now. They converted to the religion of Judaism in roughly the uh, 7th century, about 638 um, A.D. They did it for political expediency, not for religion. The king, King Butar, made it a commandment, basically uh, uh, the kingdom of Caesarea. All, all subjects had to become converted to Judaism. Now that's the, the, the deep, dark secret that they hate to get out there. I found, boy, when you start talking about that, holy cow, you really get their, their, they get upset at you for that. But that's the truth. It's not being anti-Semitical. It's not being hateful. It's just declaring the truth. Even, even some of the, the own the Jewish rabbis and scholars absolutely admit that that's the truth. It's in the, it's in the Judaic Encyclopedia. They're, it's in their own writings. They just don't want the goy, the Christians, to understand that. Do you think that there is an internal struggle uh, within the community then of, of those who are of Sephardic descent and those who are Ashkenazim or, or Khazarians? Well, absolutely. If you study and look what's really going on in the state of Israel, the nation state of Israel, the Sephardim are are hated. They're 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 ridiculed. They're denigrated. They're definitely third class citizens there uh, because of again they they call them uh, it's a racist almost uh, mentality to the Sephardic bloodline, which includes I got to tell you uh, people of color. I mean a lot of uh, of Negroes are claim their and show their Sephardim Hebrew d descent. And so, yeah, it's it's definitely racist, uh, powerfully so. Well, I, I remember hearing about the Beta Israelites, the Ethiopian Jews for many years, and the, how, how deeply suppressed they were. Absolutely. Many of them are wiped out. I mean, it's talk about genocide. See, and, and this is, a, again, a global hoax, of, again, for the, for the desire of world domination. Here's Webster Terpley. Welcome, Webster. What's up? <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Kevin. I'll try not to rant too much. And uh, there is this United well, Front. Against, the United Front against Austerity is going to meet in uh, New York City on October 27th, and you can go to the uh, Against Austerity UFAA uh, webpage to find out all about that. And I hope we can come back and talk about that at the end. But my principal goal today is to tell people about this new book. As you say, it's called "Just Too Weird: Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America with Polygamy, Theocracy." and subversion. And people can buy this by going to progressivepress.com, progressivepress.com. You can also get it through my website, topley.net, if people are familiar with that. And uh, I think you can get it on Amazon. But if you go directly to progressivepress.com, a meritorious publisher, has other distinguished authors like Kevin as well, um, please go directly because then the, the, uh, the Amazon people, of course, take a big uh, rake off on what they sell. 
So this is a book. It just came out. It's uh, it's about 260 pages. I think it's uh, it's pretty well documented. It's not exactly a scholarly work, but it's uh, it's it's timely. And what it proposes is uh, you see Romney is of course a liar. He's the etch a sketch candidate. He's the shape shifter. He's this moving target. Nobody knows what he believes, uh, except, of course, that in general he's a reactionary and a warmonger. That's obvious. But it, other than that, the details are very, very hard to pin down. So what I tried to do is to is to say, look, let's uh, let's not pay too much attention to the words coming out of his mouth right now, but let's look at the tradition from which he emerges, and that is Mormonism, right? Starting a little bit before 1830 or so in the area of Rochester, New York, Palmyra. It's the burned over area where they'd had so many religious revivals that they'd become cynical and uh, indeed, I think, lost their moral compass. And, well, well, just uh, out of curiosity, Webster, what, what does the burned over area signify? What was burned over? Was it burned over by so many lightning strikes from the divine? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, t- so many religious hucksters that had come through with revival camp meetings and then turned out to be uh, essentially baseless. It, it, it really goes like this, and it, it's an interesting story. Um, you have the Great Awakening in New England, right, centering in the Connecticut River Valley, which uh, it, it's the border between uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, and going down sort of through center-west Massachusetts. This was the land of Jonathan Edwards, a very, very evil figure. Uh, one of the prime figures of Calvinism, and his uh, his family then includes Aaron Burr, the arch traitor Aaron Burr, the uh, you know enemy of Jefferson, but of course he he was the father of Andrew Jackson. These are stories that lead us far afield. But the people who founded Mormonism came out of this area of the Great Awakening, and if you remember Jonathan Edwards' infamous uh, sermon, "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." that God is angry, hates humanity, wants to strike, wants to kill you, uh, watch out. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrendous thing. It's, it's guys like him that drove me to convert to Islam. Right. This is, there's nothing compassionate or merciful about, about the God of Jonathan Edwards. So a lot of people had been through that, right, and that's in the 1740s, 1750s. It's actually also a British uh, preacher, right, some, some British preachers who play a, a really a larger role than Jonathan Edwards. But then these same people then, with the American frontier moving west, they move into uh, north, uh, northern uh, New York State, right, upstate and western New York. So we're in the area now between Syracuse, Rochester, uh, Buffalo, out here. And it's the area where the Erie Canal uh, has just come through, right? It's just coming through. This is slightly north of that. But um, this is where it emerges, right? And he- here we have another round in the 1820s, uh, 18, in the teens and the 20s, we then have the uh, the Great Revival. So we have the Great Awakening and then the Great Revival. And the, the problem that you've seen, and you see this today with the, the Christian evangelicals, is that when you have gone through these born-again experiences several times, um, it, it, it does, I think, some damage to one's uh, psyche. And people become cynical and... Uh, I think, uh, well, the word I would say is antinomian. They, they begin to believe that there really is no moral law, that morality does not exist. And this is the, this is the leading feature of the family of Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, and his mother is a very, very hardline antinomian. This is what you see in Romney, by the way. I can connect this to... No wonder Romney's hooking up with the neocons, because that's exactly what they believe from their own uh, weird take on philosophy. Yes. They, they, of Leo Strauss. Exactly. The, the neocons are coming from Nietzsche and, uh, well, uh, Leo, uh, uh, Carl Schmitt, right, who believes yeah, the same yeah. thing. And then Strauss Leo Strauss is, yeah. is the Jewish version of Carl Schmitt. And Carl Schmitt, of course, was Hitler's lawyer. So the, a close friend of Hitler's lawyer, Leo Strauss, uh, who gets money, as did Carl Schmitt from the Rockefeller Foundation, is the, uh, he's the big guru for the for the neocons, and, and they believe, you know, alles ist, ist erlaubt, as, as Nietzsche says, right? You can do anything you want. Everything is allowed. But in the case of the, the Mormons, it's this antinomianism. And the antinomianism is, this, if, if they were Christian, which they're not, right? Mormonism is 
a whole separate religion. It's not Christianity, not Judaism, not Islam, and it's a separate country. But the um, the antinomianism basically says, you're the Latter-day Saints. The saints are not bound by any laws, plus the end of the world is at hand. Right, The Messiah will soon be here. And that has usually been used as a formula, be it in Christianity or Judaism, uh, and perhaps in others, that, that 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 means the moral law is suspended. Right? In other words, when That's the millennium really comes, yeah, that happened in Islam with Hassani Sabah and the so-called assassins, the Ismaili yes. assassins of the Middle Ages. Same thing. If they throw right. The, the thing that the thing it. that um, that Bernard Lewis uh, is so obsessed with the Ismailis. Exactly. All right. So this this is generally not a good thing, uh, and and th- that's built into Mormonism. In other words, it's it's. Um, Essentially, a, a religion that that they don't proclaim it. Right? The neocons have proclaimed the necessity of lying and and so forth. With the Mormons, it's it's not quite so open, but it's there. The Mormons have a whole series of things they call shelf doctrines. Right? This, in normal terms, this would be esoteric, exoteric. Right? The exoteric is what you tell the world. The esoteric is what goes on in your secret. That sounds council. like the neocons too. That's right out of Strauss. Uh, yes, except this is before, right? This antedates uh, any of their stuff, and this it it, it does it, it it is the the convergence because what you've just identified is what a Romney administration would look like. Is uh, neocons would be running the foreign policy, and then on the domestic side it would be Mormons, and you can see this through the presence of Mike Levitt, the former governor of Utah, who has been made the tri- the uh, transition director for Romney. Uh, he's a died in the wool Mormon. He's a fifth or sixth generation, fifth generation Mormon himself. Uh, he is uh, the transition director. He is likely to be the White House chief of staff, and he's filling the plum book with with Mormons, uh, with uh, with the members of the Latter Day Saints. In other words, quite a few people, Wayne Madsen, some others, have been warning about a wave of Mormon nepotism that has never been seen before, right, uh, beyond anything that any other administration has done. The other thing to add about uh, Romney uh, is that he is a close personal friend of Benjamin Netanyahu and has been since 1976 when they worked together in the same office. They both were employed by the Boston Consulting Group. So they have uh, had a lifelong partnership or a four-decade or almost four-decade partnership where B.B., gives political advice to Mitt, and Mitt gives politi- uh, financial advice to, to Bibi. And if you go back to the Republican primaries, Romney has been very open to the fact that he, uh, you may remember when, when Newt Gingrich said the Palestinians were, were uh, culturally inferior and things like this, uh, Romney uh, said, well, you, you should watch out. You shouldn't say that unless you, uh, you clear that with Netanyahu. Then later Romney said the same thing. So presumably Netanyahu approved approved that. But what he said is that he would he would make Netanyahu the arbiter of U.S. policy in the Middle East openly. Right? This maybe has been the case. Oh boy! Well, everybody better uh, quickly dig a fallout shelter then. Yeah, it's dangerous. Um, and again, um, there is this apocalyptic element, which I guess we sh- we should also point to. The the Mormon idea. It, it is is this notion that Joseph Smith introduced, right, that Christ came back to earth after the ascension, right? The ascension is, is uh, it's, you know, in, it's uh, in the New Testament. But the, what, what uh, Joseph Smith adds to that is that Christ then comes back to earth, and uh, this occurs in uh, Jackson County, Missouri, most likely. It's somewhat controversial. Some say Central America or South America, but... I think most of them would say Jackson County, Missouri, of all places, which is where they say the uh, the Garden of Eden was, right? And that Adam, uh, you know, was there, and that later when he was kicked out and had to go east of Eden, that's uh, that's a little bit further east in uh, in Missouri. So uh, that's where Christ will return. So the idea is that the saints, the Mormons, will gather. Some of them will be in Salt Lake City, but it, I guess at some point they're all going to move to, to uh, Jackson County, Missouri. However, parallel you know, to Webster, this... Let me just stop you for a second. That's, that's kind of interesting and evocative uh, in that you know, this apocalyptic theology is pointing towards that part of Missouri, which really isn't very far 
from the New Madrid Fault, where we're all waiting for a nine-point earthquake to level about half of the eastern half of the United States. And, and this was, of course, this was not long after, right? The, the Book of Mormon is, what, 10 or 15, 10, uh, 10 or 20 years at the most after, after precisely that earthquake. But see, the, right. the idea is this. The Mormons also want the ingathering of the Jews to Palestine. And indeed, the... Uh, when when uh, Joseph Smith sends his first leadership team, he really he sends the entire leadership of the Mormon Church to England, which I th I'd like to come back to that because I think that's the key to the whole thing. But he also sends a delegation to Palestine, uh, and the the guy in Palestine meets with the uh, the rabbis and and others in Jerusalem and it puts out a call that that uh, there should be now the the return of the diaspora. And the Jews should gather in Jerusalem, preparatory to the end of the world. So, Jeez, so the Mormons kind of are like the original system. Zionists. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I guess you could say that. In other words, they, Zion in Mormonism, Zion can mean, for example, Zion for them is Jackson County, Missouri. And when they, for example, if you're a Mormon stake president, right, like like Romney was a Mormon stake president, what they mean by stake is a, a stake in the tent. Of Zion, right? The, the stake that you pound into the ground when you put up, put up a tent. So you have the New Jerusalem or Zion; these are more or less interchangeable. And then you have the the Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and and that's also Zion. So those are the two poles. Wow. Now, here's the thing: yeah, where do you know, they Webster, get? I, I just get, I just came up with a thought here. Why, why don't we solve the whole Middle East problem by moving Israel and all of the Mormons to the uh, New Madrid fault zone, Missouri? And uh, then when the earthquake comes, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be free and clear. Well, I'm, I'm for a peaceful uh, solution, and I don't want to see anybody swallowed up. This is not my goal. But here's the thing, to kidding. denounce what this is. The thesis of my book, some, some or most of what I've told you now is, is fairly well known. The thing that is unique about my book is this, that I make the case that the Mormons are a deployment of the British East India Company. In other words, that is their sponsor. They are sponsored by the principal engine of colonialism and imperialism in their time. The people who brought you Zionism, the British, mm -hmm. Lord Palmerston. But in this case, it's a little bit older. It's the generation before Lord Palmerston. So uh, in particular, uh, people should take a look at On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. Right? John Stuart Mill, was, uh, he, you know, he was a top official of the British East India Company. He was the intelligence director of the British East India Company. He worked in it all his life. This is the this is the the engine of of genocide in India, right? They killed 20, 30, 40 million, 50 million people. Unbelievable stuff that they did. Uh, his education was supervised by Jeremy Bentham, who, to just briefly, is one of the greatest monsters of uh, of recent centuries. Uh, and I can't go into Jeremy Bentham because this just gets to be. Out of out of sight, but uh, it's actually the, the, ironic that li the libertarians uh, had considered John Stuart Mill a hero for his book on yeah, liberty. Yeah, well, when in fact, what you know, the, what he actually did during his lifetime with the East India Company was well, pretty far right, exactly. from any kind he, of libertarian ideal. Exactly, he he argued there was the great the great mutiny in India right at the end of the 1850s in in this time of uh, you know Rig, Brigham Young by then. But John Stuart Mill was the top intelligence official of the British East India Company. And when the rest of the British oligarchy said, look, you know, the rule of the British East India Company is so monstrous and so genocidal, this is embarrassing us, we're going to transfer India to the British crown. In other words, India is not going to be the private property of this East India Company that's killing everybody. We're going to have British colonial administrators go in there. Je uh, John Stuart Mill fought to the last to prevent that from happening. He said, no, India's private property. Don't politicize India. Leave it in private hands. Don't have the, the government come in. So this monster, he's another monster, John Stuart Mill, trained by Bentham. He had a nervous breakdown early in life. His father, James Mill, is another one of these characters uh, in the British East India Company. And he writes the history of, of, uh, of India, right? Very, very interesting, history of British India. So they're all involved in this India stuff. And um, you take a look at On Liberty. If you look at On Liberty, there's a whole passage, quite long. I put it in my book, excerpt, excerpted. He defends, John Stuart Mill defends Mormonism. By this point, the Mormons are out in Utah. They're in Salt Lake City. And th there's a worldwide scandal 
about the fact that Brigham Young is a theocratic dictator, more absolute than the Tsar of Russia, right? Life and death power over everybody, because he's a theocrat, he's the prophet, he's God's you know, representative, not even vicar, he's practically God on earth. And uh, the big question, there's a whole genre of literary studies, uh, the escape from Salt Lake City, because the idea is that women are being kidnapped and, uh, you know, uh, conned into going to Salt Lake City, and then they want to get out, and the women don't want to let them out. And this, this there, there's a again, famous Conan Doyle story, a Sherlock Holmes story on that. Exactly. The study in Scarlet. That's a little bit later, but that's exactly the same kind of genre. But, for example, you, you may be interested in uh, 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 Eliza Webb. There, uh, recently, there's been a, a movie on TV here called The 19th Wife, which is a kind of a, it's a, it's a, a mo <coughs> modern story with historical flashbacks back to Brigham Young. Uh, it's on the lifetime. You know, these, these Mormons are so, so barbaric, Webster. I mean, don't they realize you're supposed to stop at four wives? No, no, it's, no, no. In, 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 in the case of my fellow Muslims, <laughs> I got it. But, but uh, Brigham, uh, Joseph Smith, the, the estimates. Joseph Smith is is precisely an antinomian. In other words, he practices polygamy, but he denies it. He lies about it all his life. He goes to his death. He was killed by a mob, and this is deplorable. It's illegal and, and everything bad, but he, he was a polygamist for much of his life, and he denied it all the time. But he had, he's somewhere between 35 wives is the low estimate, maybe 85 wives is the high estimate, and the scholarly consensus is somewhere in the 50s, right, the mid-50s for him. And then Brigham Young is similar. He's um, up in the 50 to 60, maybe 70 range. Uh, the difference is that with Joseph Smith, polygamy is practiced but denied, and it's only for the Mormon elite. Under Brigham Young, Brigham Young says, I'm going to make polygamy, open, impudent, you know, wild polygamy, the key organizing principle of the state of Deseret. I'm going to get every antinomian that I can from England, Scotland, and, and uh, Wales, which is where most of them come from, get them into Utah. We're going to set up the empire of polygamy, uh, and uh, the idea is once you're a polygamist, right, once you have a troop of five or six wives, you can't leave. In other words, you can't go anywhere in the world, really, and practice that. You can't go to Europe. You can't go uh, to most, most places, right, most, most places in the Western world. Anyway, you cannot, you cannot well, go there. Well, it's such a terrifying wives. specter, Webster, just imagining having 50, 60, 70 wives. I mean, I, uh, just one wife is, is terrifying enough. Uh, yeah, that's, least. of course, there, there's a whole literature about that, too. Uh, but I, I would urge you, in the case of Joseph Smith, I think he is a sex maniac. Uh, he says, he says, every time I see a pretty woman, I have to pray for grace. In the case of Brigham Young, it's much more cynical. It's a power move. Uh, and indeed, Joseph Smith is also interested in power over individual women. But in the case of Brigham Young, the idea is, I'll get people here, they will enter into polygamy, and then they can't leave. Because the point is, this is not a great place to be, right? This is the Great Basin. It's the Intermountain West. It's very arid. It's very, very dry. And, and what comes out of this is an economy in southern Utah, which is where the Romney family comes from, St. George, and the, which was the uh, – this is where Romney's uh, uh, great-great-grandfather, Miles A. Romney and Miles P. Romney, helped build a, uh, a summer palace. I'm sorry, a winter palace for Brigham Young in this sort of southwest corner of uh, of Utah, right, pointing towards towards California. Down there, you know, you know all of this talk of antinomianism, Webster, seems very strange uh, to those of us who have known uh, very nice, normal, ordinary Mormons uh, who they won't even drink coffee because that coffee is haram or uh, <laughs> illegal in their religion. They seem very, this is very kind and down to earth and they don't drink alcohol. They're not wild partiers. They don't, they're not polygamous at all. Uh, they're very, very monogamous. And, and so, you know, how do you make that connection between this quality of the normal Mormons that one meets and their wild and crazy antinomian ancestors? Well, again, it, it, any organization is, gonna, is going to display a, a tremendous dualism between the, <coughs> the rank-and-file members on the one hand and the elite on the other. And on, on the elite side, 
I think it, it, it looks very, very different. Um, just a couple of things, right? Uh, polygamy is alive and well in southern Utah. So there's a lot of polygamy in southern Utah, northern Arizona. There's a, there's a place called Hilldale, Utah, which shades over into Colorado City, Arizona, which is it's polygamous. The mayor is a polygamist, the chief of police, the fire chief, the city council, the judges. Nobody but a polygamist has a chance in these places. Uh, well, you think the then, women would get elected to all the public offices since they would be out voting the men by quite a No, but they, that's the point. And this is this is a system of slavery of women. The, the the background for this situation is it used to be when this was farming that the Mormon farmer became the overseer. And if he had five or six wives, the five or six wives were the field hands, and the and the man was then the overseer who would supervise the work but not have to do it. So it's it's a it's a it's an ugly system. You also have to think who who is left out of polygamy? Young men, because a lot of young men will not find wives, and this is exactly what you see in this Hilldale, Utah, and Northern Arizona. There, there are, uh, this guy Warren Jeps, right? The, the, put a name on it, right? Warren Jeps is now in the federal pen and probably going to stay there for the rest of his life, unless Romney pardons him, right? But Warren Jeff so far is, is, is in the pen, uh, and, and his practice was to find any excuse you could to kick out young men, because those were a factor of instability, because they were not going to find wives. The other people who suffer, well, all women suffer, but especially the older ones, because the older ones can simply be kicked out, right? Uh, Brigham Young was a multimillionaire. He was fabulously wealthy. And he would, at a certain point, he would simply tell these wives, I'm not supporting you anymore. Get out. Uh, you know, go beg. Right? You're on your own. And, and they have no rights, right? Because the courts are all controlled by Mormon uh, judges, right? The probate courts, in particular, was the way that, that, that Brigham Young ruled. But now, t- today, right? Uh, Orrin Hatch has been asked, uh, you know, what's, what's with this polygamy that's flourishing in southern Utah? And Orrin Hatch, running for Senate, said, oh, some of my best friends are polygamists. I think polygamists are very fine people. Oh, is that so? Uh, let's take Mike Levitt. Mike Levitt is on his way right now to become the White House Chief of Staff, right? He has a good 50-50 chance of doing that. Uh, during the build-up to the 2002 Winter Olympics, Mike Levitt was asked, the governor at that time, what do you think of polygamy? And he said, I think it may be covered by religious freedom. No. <laughs> and again, religious freedom, the First Amendment, it, 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 it pertains to worship, to churches, to church buildings, monasteries, whatever you want, to belief, to speech and writing. But when you pass into the area of overt acts, then the civil magistrate is the one who has the, the, uh, the, the purview. And in particular, if you look deeper into Mormonism, right, beyond the polygamy, shocking and, and horrifying as that is, it is a relic of barbarism, right? That's what the Republican Party said in 1856, right? The, the 1856 Republican platform said, we're against two relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. And it meant the Confederates and the, uh, and, and the, and the Mormons. But if you, if you look deeper, uh, the fact that Joseph Smith was not acclaimed dictator of the United States, right, that the American people did not bow down and worship Joseph Smith but rather that a mob, you know, tarred and feathered him, kicked him out of Missouri, and then ultimately in uh, in Illinois uh, lynched him, right, killed him uh, with with firearms. This is the grievance of the Mormons, and this I think you're going to find quite deeply that uh, and and among some of those upstanding moral individuals, they have a narrative of persecution. They believe that the United States has treated them badly. Now. And, and the again, problems, this kind of reminds remind us of of the uh, Zion, Jewish Zionist neocons who also have a narrative of you know we're the chosen people and we've been horribly persecuted throughout history and here we're kind of you know getting back at the world. Well, and certainly on that side, you know Romney has reached out. Let me know. The likely Secretary of State is John Bolton, neocon. We've got Robert Joseph is the guy who wrote in the words about Saddam Hussein looking for yellow cake in Niger. He's on the team. Um, the handler for Paul Ryan is Dan Senior, the spokesman for the provisional, uh, the, the coalition provisional authority of Iraq, the occupation. He was the spokesman for the for the indefensible. You've got Elliot Cohen, a kind of intellectual neocon from Johns Hopkins, had, was in the State Department also with Condi. 
in the second term of Bush, um, Robert Kagan, right, from this Kagan family. His brother designed the surge in, uh, in um, Iraq and, and also in, in Afghanistan, a military planner. Uh, so they're in there, right? They are going to control foreign policy. I, I'm surprised people say Americans don't vote on foreign policy. Well, you better, because uh, among <laughs> other things, because yeah. those, those neocons are going to come back. And they're coming back with their own grievance. They have a you're very right to say they have their traditional grievances. They have another grievance. They say, we got a bad deal under Bush. We were treated unfairly by the press. We were doing great. The American people didn't stay the course, right? The American people are no good. They didn't support us. We should have gone all the way in Iraq, all the way in Afghanistan, you know, hundreds of thousands. We should have gone into Iran. Don't, don't forget Iran. Yeah, and, and of course. that they, they So from their point of view, from the point of view of these neocons around, around Romney, they'd say, we want to vindicate ourselves. Well, how are they going to do that? Uh, given who they are, these are one-trick ponies, as we've seen over quite a few years. They only know one thing. They'll say, oh, our past wars of aggression are considered a failure. We'll vindicate ourselves now with new and successful wars of aggression. So <laughs> there's all this. Right. But let me just we didn't back. do it big enough last time. Let, let's, let's blow up uh, you know, 10 skyscrapers and, and then go, you know, go to war against Iran, a country you know, three times as big. Yeah, as and, and uh, if you want to see some scenarios for, um, for horrendous things, uh, if you want to read about the destruction of Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, you can find this in the prophetic literature of the Mormons because they, they are absolutely fascinated by the idea of New York being destroyed. And this is in my book. Right? I, I was uh, shocked to see a genre that I had really not seen of people writing prophetically about the destruction of most of the United States and relishing it, right? Not that this was a horrible thing, but that this was God's justice. Now, this gets me back, back mm. to Brigham Young. That sounds, that sounds worse than Osama bin Laden. <laughs> again, remember that on 9-11, the, the one official we know was flying around in a national command center in a doomsday aircraft uh, was Brent Scowcroft, top Mormon, died in the war Mormon, Kissinger's right-hand man, and I think the, the gray eminence of the Mormon mafia, the Mormon, the Mormon mafia in the CIA and the Mormon mafia in the, in the FBI and the State Department. This is a powerful faction, and just an, an excursus on this, right? The way it comes about yeah. is... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, the, I was going to say, uh, isn't there a prophecy uh, about the Mormons somehow coming to seizing power and establishing a Mormon theocracy over the yeah, entire U.S.? There is, and I just, I'll mention that, let me just, it, it, just, since we started with the Mormon mafia, where this comes from. You look at Mitt Romney, what did he do? He went abroad for two years, went to France, served as a, as a missionary, comes back with some French. One of his kids, they, none of them ever joined the military, right? They're all chicken hawks. They're all warmongers, but... They ain't going. Well, Rom Romney was a draft evader. You know, I helped break that story where he, yeah, he was actually. I'd like to see some sources. He, he wasn't allowed to be a missionary. There, was, there were no Mormon missionaries in France. It was illegal. He was just gallivanting around France, uh, and he, apparently he never filled out any of the paperwork. So he was technically uh, a criminal draft evader. Uh, from the French point of view, I think he, he might have been illegal. Uh, but, but of course, we, we we would need to see some 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 backup on this, right? Not just uh, you know. Who's the witness? Who's who's the source? Or you know what's the source? Where do we find it? But the the the, the Mormon mafia. Right? I think this is highly relevant because the Mormon mafia is who carried out this Benghazi uh, uh, situation. Right? The fact that this ambassador died, he was assassinated by a CIA asset Kumu. He was uh, not defended by a CIA rapid intervention group of twelve people that was there that didn't intervene. And the 17th of February Martyrs Brigade was there, and they're a CIA asset, and they didn't do anything for them either. So the, the CIA is involved in this in, in three or four ways. And I say that's the, the CIA Mormon Mafia. How do we get a CIA Mormon Mafia? They go overseas, they come back with a language, they, they don't join the military, at least a lot of them don't, and then they, they go into the, the CIA because they can say, I know a foreign language, I have foreign experience, and I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't womanize, I'm a straight arrow, I live clean, and this is, is a great formula to get promoted. Plus, you've got Brent Scowcroft and people like that making sure that, that, the, that the saints go up the ladder. Now, let's go to the prophecies. There are probably two or three we should mention. Uh, the one that I was trying to get to first was the one from Brigham Young 
This is about 1845, 1846. This is the Oath of Vengeance, and this is the this is I think the one of the most relevant for for Romney. The Oath of Vengeance says, "I swear to exact revenge from the United States and the American people for the murders of the prophets Joseph Smith, his brother Hiram Smith, and others." And I promise wow. to teach this to my children down to the fourth generation. So it's a blood vendetta against the United States. Now, th this is, it's not wise to put somebody in as president who comes out of this tradition. And it, it's not a remote tradition at all. This was part of the liturgy. In other words, it's part of the, like the Mormon Book of Common Prayer, the Mormon church service, right? The, what they call the temple endowment. Until about 1927 or 1948, every time you went to a Mormon temple, which is not not the local church, but it's it's a somewhat higher level, right? There's one here in Washington, uh, right outside the Beltway. It, it towers over the Beltway. You see it every time you go around the Beltway. The, the the temple endowment had this until the late 1920s. Now, since it does contain this thing about teach it to your children and bind them down to the fourth generation. Well, George Romney, the father of Mitt Romney, was going to the Mormon temple in the late 1920s. Right? He, that, he would have been you know, taking that oath repeatedly, and that means that he must have taught this to his son, Mitt, who has taught it to Tag, and to Tag's children, right? That would make four generations. But wait a minute. Is, isn't, uh, I thought George Romney was, by all accounts, a pretty honorable public servant. He was opposed to the Vietnam War. Uh, had a, a pretty good reputation, a much better reputation than Mitt, who apparently made his money off laundering uh, drug money, among other things. I'm sure you've heard about that. His 173% uh, average annual return on investment at being capital yeah. over a decade. Uh, but but George Romney had a pretty good reputation. Now, it could, well, I'm afraid he, not. He now he, here's the thing. Here's the thing with George Romney. You have to know that during the 1930s, the the Mormons were beyond soft on fascism. They were essentially pro Hitler, and I have uh, quite a bit of stuff about that in the book. That in uh, in 1933, the the uh, Mormon um, Pravda, right, the the Deseret uh, News. The House organ, you know, official party organ of the Mormons, because it's a political faction. That's why I'm, that's how I'm treating them. They say this thing about Hitler. Oh, Hitler's a great guy. He's a vegetarian. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. The 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 message is practically he's practically one of us, right? He's clean living. Uh, you know, uh, Goebbels doesn't drink. Um, right, all this stuff. Then guys would probably um, even uh, take revenge on the USA too, wouldn't they? If they got the chance. Well, uh, I mean, it's speculation. What what would the Nazis have done with the Mormons if, in case the Nazis had you know gotten further? It's just speculation. You let your read the book. You'll see get some ideas when you read it. A little bit later on, uh, we have um, well, a lot later on in 1939. Okay, 1939 is very late in the day, right? We've had. The Prague Munich sellout. Right? We've had the Kristallnacht. Right? The Nazis attacking all the Jewish shops. At this point, uh, the head of the Mormon Church in Germany, and they've been allowed to exist, writes uh, an editorial or an article for the official Nazi Party organ, the Völkische Beobachter, uh, the Nazi Party Daily, where he says uh, it's called "In the Land of the Mormons," and it's basically a puff piece about. Uh, about the Mormons and how uh, the the idea of uh, das Volk, right, the people, and indeed die Rasse, right, race, the key Nazi concept, that these are somehow shared. The 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 Nazi affinity for the Mormons is that the Mormons are completely white, right. You can't be a Mormon, uh, you can't be confirmed really, or become a priest. When they say priesthood, that that would be the equivalent of confirmed in Christianity. Uh, something you do when you're about 12 or 14. Right? You, you can't get beyond that if you're black in the Mormon church. So it's a lily white church, and it's it's highly lily white today. So the Nazis had a great affinity for that. Uh, it's a racially based church. That's what the Nazis uh, saw. 
and 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 this is practical. The only well, church, you know, that, that's inter- interesting, isn't it, Webster? From that point of view, that that Romney is such a walking caricature of all of the ugliest negative stereotypes about rich white guys, and he's running against the first black president, Obama. Uh, it's it's kind of an interesting, uh, you know, stark uh, black and white contrast here. Yeah, and he. Um... He 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 is that right? He's not a wasp. He's a wasm. I'm sorry. No, he's a. I, no, I'm mixing it up. I'm getting the, the things wrong. But it, it it is. But but with the, this difference, right? Jim Crow, and and white supremacy is anchored in Mormon theology. It's anchored in the Book of Abraham, a later you know uh, fake revelation by Joseph Smith, which says if you if you come from the line of Ham, who has dark skin, then you can't be a you can't be a priest. And think what that means. In, in, you know, by the time you get to the middle of the 20th century, the only church that could guarantee you a lily-white congregation was the Mormons. If you were a hardcore racist, you could say, why these Baptists, they're not good enough, and these you know, Episcopalians, whatever they are. None of that is any good. Only the Mormons give me a guaranteed lily-white congregation. Now, the Mormons are running away from that. We have Mia Love running for... Uh, Congress out there in Utah, and right? she's trying to make up for it. But let me let me try to get back, just since you're asking about George Romney, and then we got to get back to the prophecies before we're done with uh, with um, with George Romney. Right, he comes out of the fact that the Mormon Church is soft and even supportive of fascism and Nazism in the 1930s. Pre- pre- well, because they have this large uh, interest there, right? They they have this church going. The Protestants, the, the, the Lutherans, and the Reformed are allowed to continue. The Roman Catholics are allowed to continue, although that's where the, the fiction is, right? The Pope Pius XI writes an encyclical condemning, uh, condemning Nazi rule before he dies in the, in the mid-30s. But then the Mormons, right? So those three, only those, Protestant, Catholic, Mormon, uh, even though it is, it's, it's categorized as a foreign cult, they think it's useful or may be useful. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists, they go to the concentration camp. Anybody else, right? Any other church. And, of course, uh, the Jews were indeed rounded up. So you can see when you, when you read the Mormon accounts of this, they say, oh, um, we haven't had any trouble. Some sects have been, you know, given a hard time, but not us. So this is what George Romney comes out of. Now, George Romney, his, his problems with fascism are basically uh, three things. He went to work for Alcoa, the Aluminum Corporation of America. Uh, read it in the book, um, uh, Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America from ProgressivePress.com. At, at a, a certain point, uh, the Alcoa is in a cartel with uh, German Nazi-controlled aluminum producers, and they refuse to produce aluminum for the U.S. war effort, for the British, for Lend-Lease, because they don't want to... Uh, break their cartel deals with these German producers. So Harold Dickey's top new dealer, Harold Dickey's is quoted as saying, if the Nazis win the Second World War, they can thank Alcoa because they set back our production. You know, we could have had 18,000 more planes or something like this, and they made sure that we didn't. So that's number one. He's the spokesman for that. Then he goes on to the Automobile Manufacturers Association. Who does he represent here? Henry Ford, Nazi, paid to, you know, help finance Hitler coming to power. Uh, and at the same time, Alfred P. Sloan, uh, they have Opel. Uh, Henry Ford has a plant in Germany. General Motors has a plant in Germany. Uh, the DuPonts, right? Irene DuPont, who controls General Motors, is an outright Hitler lover. He's a Hitler admirer. So, George Romney is the spokesperson for that. Now, when he ran for president, I've studied, I haven't really studied his Michigan campaigns, but I did study his, his um, presidential campaign. His basic line is, all of our problems come down to a moral crisis. It's a moral crisis. It's what you hear from Ryan, right? The poor need discipline. They need a sense of purpose, right? It's their fault that they're poor, the idea being. So is that 47%? Yeah, yeah, that's Romney, certainly. And, and I'm, even, uh, Ryan shares the same thing. Ryan, Ryan comes from a tentacle of the, of the Mormons called the John Burt Society, which we could get into if we had time. But uh, the, the, the thing then is, when Romney runs, he's running on what is called moral rearmament. This is called Buchmanism. Frank Buchman, B-U-C-H-M-A-N. 
launches this thing where he says, the issue is not fascism. As a matter of fact, I think Hitler is a great guy. Uh, but it's this moral crisis of the West, which is, which is what? This is Franco in Spain, says the same thing. And Pétain, a little bit later in France, says exactly the same thing. Or, you know, you've just heard it with, um, with uh, Senator Santorum of, of Pennsylvania. But that's, that was the line of, uh, of George Romney. So George Romney, I think, emerges as a, as a, uh, a, a rather ugly person uh, hiding this stuff behind this pontificating. Uh, also, you say Vietnam. He, he took one, t- one trip to Vietnam. The first, he took two trips. The first trip he took to Vietnam was telling the GIs, you should die stoically for your country. Everybody's going to die. It's your time to die. Go and die. And the black GI says, uh, okay, but uh, governor, can I... Can I get into your church before I die? And the answer is no, you can't. So uh, this obviously um, th- this didn't didn't sell well. So he had to then he changed himself around because he'd been pounded all his life because of the Mormons having this built-in racism, right? So he could have left the Mormon church. What is this, right? Romney is somebody who the current Romney stayed for thirty years in a racist Jim Crow white supremacist reactionary, right? Because uh, people who want that are also outright reactionary. Anti-woman, anti-labor. Um, the, the Mormon church is, you know, the, the center of gravity is it's a right-wing reactionary bunch, right? And they, they do have some factions by now, right? They can't avoid that, but that's the center of gravity. Ezra Taft Benson was Eisenhower's secretary of, La- of uh, agriculture all during the 50s. And this is the guy who said, Civil rights is communism. Martin Luther is a communist. Martin Luther King is a communist. And then when, uh, when they were starting to, people were looking around for a racist candidate in 1968, before Wallace, this job was offered to Ezra Taft Benson, who would have taken it, but the Mormon hierarchy said, no, you're going out on a limb. And then when Wallace was, was named as the American Party candidate, they offered the vice presidency to George uh, to uh, Ezra Taft Benson of the Mormons, and he said no, no again. So uh, that's what you're dealing with. Now, just quickly on the prophecies. The the oath of vengeance was in the liturgy, the temple endowment, until the late 1920s, and it presumably binds Mitt Romney. I want to know about that. There's also an oath of obedience where uh, Mitt Romney has sworn to obey in a, in a way that I don't think any Catholic does, right? To obey the Pope, I don't know if this comes in. But in the case of, of the Mormons, it is that the guy sitting in uh, Temple Square, Salt Lake City, is the prophet, the first president of the Mormon Church right now. It's a guy called Monson. Called him Monsoon. Maybe you'll remember it that way. He's got he's got dementia, I think, but he's still infallible, right? He's the he's a super Pope. He's a prophet, right? Which not every Pope obviously is. But if you're the head of the Mormon Church, you're a prophet. Uh, so that's another one. And then here's the third one, the white horse prophecy. This is Joseph Smith. It's 1843 to 1844. And he says, I'm going to tell you guys what's coming. A time is coming when the Constitution will hang by a thread. Mark those words. Hang by a thread. When the Constitution hangs by a thread, a powerful uh, leader will emerge. The Mormons will take over the United States. The Mormons are the white horse. They're going to come out of the Rockies, take over the United States. They're going to ally the white horse, Mormonism, with the red horse, the British, and conquer the world. They're going to take over the entire world, and the last struggle will be against the Tsar of Russia, although they will have to deal with the heathen Chinese, as they write. The, quote, heathen Chinese, unquote, have to be kept out, and then on to the defeat of Russia. And at that point, God's law will encompass the earth. Because yeah, Mormonism, that's kind of a scary thing for a potential president to believe. Yes. And, uh, and the, the, we can tie this to Romney through a number of articles where we have um, sort of uh, bi- biographical uh, you know, reminiscences from people that knew him. When he was at Brigham Young University in particular, after he came back from France, he was at BYU, named after this his character, Brigham Young, right? Secessionist, hated Lincoln, you know, seceded from the Union uh, in 1857. But when Romney was at BYU, he uh, is touted 
as the great white horse hope. He's touted as the, the guy, you know, uh, strong, strong leader coming our way. He's the son of the top Mormon elected official in the United States. Romney is a descendant. He's got, the, he's a fifth generation Mormon. Uh, it, it, he goes back to, uh, this, uh, Parley P. Pratt, P-R-E-T-T. Parley Pratt is probably second only to Joseph Smith in, in his uh, impact on the first two decades of Mormonism. He's a top theologian. He's a guy who comes up with the polytheism, because they have it, right? They're polytheistic, uh, the polygamy, of course, and this theocracy, right? That self-government is blasphemy. It's got to be the dictatorship of God on earth. It's exactly what you hear from Al-Qaeda, except this is, uh, this is within the realm of, of Christianity. There's got to be a Christian worldwide yeah, empire. Yeah, and I don't find that necessarily bad in itself. The problem is when the delegation uh, of authority from God goes to these hierarchies made up of people, uh, you know, crazed, militaristic people with dementia, uh, you know, fascist types and so on. But, it, you know, anybody who is purely dedicated to the only real ruler is God is going to be actually immune to some of the uh, that negative tendencies of human power seeking, don't you think? Well, I'm on the I'm on the Dante line, which is that uh, you need two sons, right? Uh, it, one son shows you the way to God. One shows you the the uh, the equally important uh, way to uh, to order the earth, right? Western civilization is based on the idea that the Pope is one guy, the King or the Emperor is another one, and they fight. And this is the opening of the Western mind: is that 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 division of powers is is what. Well, I'm a Muslim. I don't want I don't want either Pope or King. No, but it's, I'm just saying, in, in terms of, a, call, call it a generic religious authority and a generic political authority, these are divided. Contrast this, say, to the Byzantine Empire. In the Byzantine Empire, the religious authority, the patriarch, is a dépendance of the emperor, and the emperor is the political authority, semi-deified or, or deified all the way. I think, in the Western world at least, this, this is not the way. Uh, we're going to have to have this constitutional separation of church and state is just another way of saying the same thing mosque and state church and state mm -hmm. synagogue and state whatever you right, want right now, and I, than, I do support that in the usa i think the constitution here is a, a very valuable document even if it is only hanging by a thread at, at this point well again i would watch out for that hanging by a thread because once you say hanging by a thread this is what romney is supposed to carry out he, according to these these biographical accounts he has been touted his whole life as the guy who's going to going to implement the White Horse prophecy. Now, I invite people to think about that. Try to remember what it was like under Bush, right? When Bush was asked, did you ask your father, this other president, about going to war? He said, no, I, I, I consulted a higher father. Um, that's already scary. But when, when the Mormons come forward and say, the Constitution hangs by a thread, the White Horse and the Red Horse have to take over the world, and the final battle will be the Chinese first and the Russians second, then you hear Romney coming forward with this lunatic stuff that Russia is the main strategic foe of the United States. That's insane. And you're going to put that into the White House with Mike Levitt and a, and a, uh, a, a crew of Mormons. Just before we leave Mike Levitt, I, this is something that, that could become a scandal, I would hope, in the last weeks of the campaign. When Romney went out to Salt Lake City to save the Winter Olympics of 2002. His main purpose was to cover up. They had bribed, they had spent millions of dollars bribing the officials of the International Olympic Committee in the form of scholarships for their kids, their brother-in-law's kids, right? all this you know, corruption. In the middle of that was Mike Levitt. He was the one that Romney saved. Uh, he prevented federal prosecution of Mike Levitt. Uh, who was widely accused. The, the people who were indicted, the Mormons who were indicted, said, we did everything with Mike Levitt. Indict him, too. And no. And finally, these two guys were let off by a judge who was also a Mormon. So <laughs> that has, much has not changed in, uh, in Mormondom. The other thing about Mike Levitt is that he was, I told you already, he was asked if, if um, polygamy is uh, legal. And he said, yeah, it may be religious freedom. Romney has written two books one is called Turnaround, where he covered these, it's the cover-up of the cover-up. It's trying to make this Salt Lake City Olympics into a great thing. That's Turnaround. And he's got another one called No Apologies, which is that he'll never apologize. <laughs> right? Being a great man is that you never say you're sorry. Both of these 
say that when the Romney family fled the United States, they turned their back on the United States. They didn't give a damn about the U.S. They were going to Mexico. And the cause was polygamy. Uh, very interesting thing, right? Choose between the patriotism, loyalty to the United States on the one side that they claim to have, polygamy on the other. At that point, they say, Viva Mexico! Let's go to Mexico and practice polygamy. And that's what they did. And they would have stayed there had it not been for Pancho Villa coming along with his army and, and chasing them out. Which is, and, and what's that's interesting a, about this, Webster, is that uh, George Romney's father apparently lost his citizenship for fleeing a felony charge to Mexico and then remaining there for X number of years. And Romney was born, George Romney was born in Mexico, uh, and then when they moved back to the U.S., they never immigrated or repatriated or, or got their citizenship back, which meant that George Romney, as well as his father, were both illegal aliens. Yes, and uh, if, if George Romney had ever gotten close to the White House, right, having been born in Mexico from people, at the time that he was born in Mexico, the parents had no intention of returning. It's only Pancho Villa that, that, uh, that drove them out. Just as, as an aside, the huge, you know, Mexican revolution of, of you know, around World War I, um, not much studied in the United States, but I, I all the kind of like Pancho Villa, but but you know, if, yeah, if, sure, if, exactly. Putting the Romney back it, in the U.S., I'm not so sure if I like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wanted to kick them out. All all the Romneys can see the whole immense Mexican Revolution. All they can see there is envy. In other words, the typical Mormon mentality is that they they're indifferent to anybody's suffering but their own. Right? They're in Nazi Germany. The Jews are getting it. The Seventh-day Adventists are getting whacked. All these other people are getting hit. They don't care about that because they say, oh, we were mistreated. Uh, Joseph Smith got a raw deal. And now in Mexico, right, you know, the tens of millions of people are being crushed by landowners and latifundists and reactionaries and God knows what. And all they can say is, uh, Pancho Villa was full of envy. He wanted to steal our land that we had developed, and he thought that he could run it better, but then, of course, it... It collapsed. So that this sure does. This sure sounds like the Zionists, doesn't it? <laughs> same, I think it sounds right. like a Mormon. In other words, I don't. I don't think the Zionists have any monopoly on evil at all. And there are other kinds well, of. It's not, it's not just, no, it's not just evil. I'm just saying that the, in both cases we have a group of people that has a narrative of we were horribly mistreated, and that makes them totally indifferent to the suffering. Yes, of besides, well, in, in terms of yeah, post post World War II, that's exactly right. Yes. That, and that one, they, they say that one was invented by Meyer Lansky, who, who regarded this as. From his point of view, benefit. He's saying, well, now that this has happened in Europe, right, and there, there was a, a large scale massacre, call it what you will, and how many millions, I don't yeah. know. But, but yeah. then Meyer Lansky said, okay, after this, I get to do whatever I want for the rest of my life. Um, mm -hmm. this is, this is bad. But now we're dealing with the Mormon. In other words, the, some of these other things are better known. What I find is that the Mormons are not known. They're just not. And one of the failings of this campaign, imagine this. Uh, the United States is supposed to be, you know, this big Christian country, right, with all these Christian fundamentalists and evangelicals and social conservatives. We are now at the point of electing a president who's not a Christian. And this does not seem to be worthy of notice, right? It, nobody points it out. This is not... Yeah, I mean, everybody's a, talking about Obama supposedly being a Muslim. When he, he exactly. Is, and, and then now, it, then then it's now we have a guy who's not a Christian. Right. It is pretty strange. And it's not just that it's not a Christian, but this is a cult. This is a bitter, sectarian, tightly knit cult. It has come into existence after 1830. Uh, just about every one of their main uh, tenets of faith can be refuted, that it's historically a fraud. Uh, Joseph Smith himself was pronounced an imposter, guilty of disorderly conduct by the state of New York in the late 1820s, he was a con man, a mountebank, uh, and so forth. Brigham Young, uh, it seems to me, is, is a monstrous figure, seceding from the Union in 1857, murdering 130 uh, travelers from Arkansas who were passing through. Later on, Brigham Young is waiting and hoping that the Union will, will lose the Civil War and then he can secede and create a polygamous empire. And it's all the British East India Company. The, the basic idea is that uh, the British want to build up a, a power against the United States in this Great Basin. 
So they move them out there, and they try to create the empire of Deseret based on based on polygamy. Uh, and we mentioned uh, John Stuart Mill defends them. Thomas Carlyle is the other big defender. Thomas Carlyle, yeah. in many ways, a precursor of European fascism of, of the of the 20th century. Th- these are both employees of the of the British East India Company. John Stuart Mill is the sponsor of Carlyle's career. Carlyle, in in turn, in turn, is one of the favorite authors of uh, of Hitler and the Nazis in in general. His life. Isn't, isn't that interesting? How, how the masters of empire use sectarian conflict to divide and conquer, uh, and that's just one example. And we're certainly seeing plenty of examples of that in the Middle East yeah, even that, now. That, that, let me cite the, the, way, the way I got introduced to this was an Iranian uh, living in uh, Paris, Ali Mazaheri, at the Etude, uh, École des Hautes Etudes Sociales, something like this. And he said, Topsy, the, uh, the three miracles of the Victorian age are Joseph Smith and the Mormons, Karl Marx and the Communists, and the Bab and Baha'i. Uh, and he said, all of these are sponsored by British intelligence in the broad sense. And I think that's all quite true. I would add two more. The celestial kingdom of the Taiping in China in these same years, 1830 to 1840. You get this guy called Hong. He's in touch with an American Baptist minister, but American with a difference. He's from South Carolina. He's a secessionist. He's a proto-Confederate. He comes from South Carolina to China, and at a certain point, his protege declares himself the younger brother of Jesus Christ. This starts a rebellion which kills between 20 and 30 million people. It's the biggest success that the so, British So the had. moral of the story is watch out for British Empire-sponsored false Watch products. out for them. And Webster, and I think we're going to have to... Let me just, I just, just to mention it, because I know you're interested. There's this guy, Sleeman, uh, the British administrator of India, Sleeman, is the guy who creates modern Hinduism. In particular, he creates the cult of thuggy, the thugs... Uh, with widow burning and uh, ritual assassination and strangling and all that. That's also a British creation. So the British are doing this across the world. And you can make an argument that Wahhabism and uh, Salafism are actually created by the British India office and then shipped into Arabia out of India. Yes, so we're, we're at least that's partly an sponsored and completely created. Okay, well, Webster, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great hour. I wish we could do it for two hours, but we would have had If to I could just, re- just reiterate, then, it's called Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover of America, Polygamy, Theocracy, Subversion, ProgressivePress.com, ProgressivePress.com, Kevin's publisher, my publisher, Pay them a visit. You can get a copy, uh, an e-book for as little as $6. Come on, $6. What's, what's the, the problem with $6? And, and if you read this, you will be ahead of the curve, just like I was ahead of the curve when Obama was elected. I already understood that Obama had uh, unsavory associations, including, you know, he's basically a made man of the CIA and the Brzezinski faction and so on. And <laughs> none of my friends knew it. So you'll be uh, months and months, if not years, ahead of the curve if you read Webster's books when they come out. Well, thank you, right. Webster Tarpley. It's always a pleasure. Uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.